Hello everyone, this is Aurora and Brian with the Central Coast Astronomical Society and we are super excited to be able to share with you tonight our trip with astronomy and I just realized you can't see Brian so let me see if I can find him for you. Let's see. Oh, wait, no, hang on. There's lots of Brian's. <laughs> yep. Um, so Brian and I are putting together a special presentation. And well, actually, it's kind of no presentation. <laughs> We're actually mm -hmm. just done a stargaze with you tonight. So we are going to get things ready to go in just a minute. Before we get started, if you can grab a pencil and a piece of paper, anything that we talk about tonight that you're thinking, ooh, I want to go do that tonight. I want to look outside. Um, just make a quick note of it. That would be great. Um, but we are from Central Coast Astronomical Society, and we're super excited to be able to share this with you for tonight. Give me just two minutes, and I will be right back. All right, welcome everyone. This is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. How are you? Are you ready to do some stargazing with us tonight? <laughs> I know I am. So tonight I have, we actually are doing something extra special for this evening. We are going to be doing some stargazing virtually. And Brian, who I'm gonna bring on right now. Brian, are you here? Let me see if I can find you. Yes, I can. There you yes, are. Yes, hello. <laughs> Brian has his telescope set up. And so we're going to go through a list of objects tonight. We've got about six or seven objects we're going to take a look at. Everything from a planet to galaxies to open clusters, as well as take a look at, um, oh, what am I thinking of? A planetary nebula as well. Yes. So we have a lot of fun things we're going to be doing. Not um, Kent is not here tonight. He's uh, So it's just Brian and myself, and we're going to be showing you how you can look in the the sky tonight and take a look so if you don't have a telescope at home this is a great opportunity for you to be able to look through our telescopes and if you have any questions as we go along please type them in the box and I know we have uh, several astronomers that will be answering questions in the chat so feel free to do that as well all right Brian are you ready I'm ready all right so do you want to um, talk just for a second I have a picture of, well, I have a picture of you here, but I also have a picture of you with your equipment. But now oh, yes. that I'm saying that, I'm thinking it's, I'm thinking it's your old setup. Is that right? Let me see. I think that the last picture I sent, I still have all that equipment. And so that is one of my setups right now. Just it's that telescope with a different camera. <laughs> and that's going to be our planetary camera for tonight. And then I have another camera and uh, telescope set up for some deep sky objects. Okay, great. Now, are you going to be inside talking to us? Or are you going to be mostly outside? I'll be out here amongst the Horsehead Nebula, as you can see, and the Flame Nebula. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually, the picture that you took, isn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm actually in my office, and then my telescopes are outside. So uh, crossing fingers, all the remote control features work properly so that I can sit here in the comfort of my home. Awesome. Okay, great. And we've already got a ton of questions about the comet. The answer is yes, we will talk about it and we will actually show it to you if we're if the conditions are good. How's the weather looking where you are? The weather is nice and clear. Now, the best we could do for Comet Leonard uh, A1 tonight, though, will be pictures that have been taken because, alas, while this is lots of fun, I don't think we want to wait until about three or four in the morning before it rises. 
Right. So, yes. So, um, Brian has sent me... Actually, Brian, can you send me those pictures one more time when you get a minute? Um, and sure. I will add them to uh, what I have going on here. That okay. would be great. Okay. All right, Brian, I'm going to um, let you take it away. And what's the first object we're going to take a look at? Let's take a look at Jupiter first. Okay. Go ahead. And all right. And here, here is a live view of Jupiter. And uh, now you'll notice that Jupiter's a little shaky. It isn't really shaking around like that. <laughs> That's because of our pesky atmosphere. Very nice for breathing, not good for astronomy. <laughs> so as light waves are coming through from that planet, then is shaking it around a little bit. And I've adjusted the exposure so you can see those distinctive bands. And in a moment, I'll, uh, I'll blow out the surface of Jupiter so we can see the Galilean moons. So a couple of facts to bring up about Jupiter, and I'm just going to bring up my notes here. There it is. So Jupiter is the fifth planet from the star, from our star, and it's the biggest planet in our solar system. In fact, uh, it's bigger than two and a half times all the other planets in our solar system put together. And if you were to put Earths across the equator, 11 Earths could fit across. Now, Jupiter takes... 12 of our years to go around the sun once, but it only takes 10 hours to rotate in a day. So while our day is 24 hours, Jupiter is only 10 hours. That is fast. And that's part of what we believe causes those distinctive bands because the wind speeds are ridiculous on this planet as, as Jupiter whips around. So the benefit is you get through your school day a lot faster, but then you, I don't know when you get some sleep in 10 hour work days, that would be kind of weird. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about anything else to bring up while we're gazing here at um, Jupiter. No, I mean, when we do our stargate or when I do stargazing with kids, we talk about different, what the, that Jupiter is made out of mostly hydrogen and helium and how it's True. mostly invisible but yet you can see it because of the tiny percentage of other things that are in there. Um, we also talk about how masers have been found at the poles. So Jupiter is emitting mm -hmm. lasers. It's like the shimmering gas cloud, but in the microwave part of the spectrum, um, we talk about how it shocks its closest in most planet Io, Io uh, oh, with yes. a current of about 3 million amps every time it gets within range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's planet. I mean, all every planet, every object that we start to study in our solar system fascinates us. Yeah. I think that's what's amazing is even as we start to look at the different moons around Saturn and Jupiter, then scientists are sometimes shocked that a lot of their theories are not uh, representing what we discover when we get a probe out there. Yeah. So I'm so, going to. Brian, did you want to talk briefly about what it is you're um, using right now? We've got a couple of questions about that. Absolutely. Um, before you do, though, uh, here, I'm going to go back to my face here. So okay. um, if you, <laughs> I, I meant to ask you, if you could let us know where you are in the world, that would be great. You can drop it in the chat right now. So astronomically speaking, we know if we should be saying Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, uh, <laughs> Equator. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that would just help us out uh, for tonight. Um, Jupiter is up. Um, it's really easy to find if you go outside tonight and kind of look south, uh, I want to say southwest, south, southwest, um, it's just the brightest thing that you're going to be seeing, one of the brightest things you're going to be seeing. Um, and I actually, I'll be able to show you some of these things um, near the end on Stellarium. But for night, for the most part, we just want to be able to share the live views with you so you can just uh, go stargazing with us. Um, one, uh, I'm going to actually ask you another question before you answer the first one I asked you, Brian. Um, <laughs> one of the questions was, do you need a telescope in order to see uh, Jupiter? You do not. You could go out right now and take and actually see Jupiter yes. and Saturn, although Saturn is begin, becoming more dim. And it's amazing. When you look right after sunset right now, once the sun sets, the first bright thing you see will be Venus and then keep on going up at oh, about a 45 degree angle and then Saturn and then Jupiter. So they've lined up nicely for us right now. Yes, and actually Jupiter's, a pair of binoculars too. Yeah, if you just look exactly. at Jupiter with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to pick out the moons of Jupiter, uh, three or four of them uh, actually really easily. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. So this setup that I'm sharing is one of two tonight. And so this is using an Orion 120 millimeter 
refractor telescope that's just about four and a half inches. And then I'm using a camera. These are specialized astronomy cameras that I'm using. It's from a company called ZWO. And, um, or I should, yeah, and it's a ZWO and it's ASI 178 MC. And the C stands for color. I, uh, many of the, the best astronomy cameras are actually black and white. And then you use filters to capture your various wavelengths of light. But I like using the one-shot color because it's better for live astronomy like we're doing tonight. Nice. Okay, great. And if you want to take a look at the alignment tonight of what this actually looks like, you can take a look here on my Stellarium program. Do you see these really bright stars here? This one's Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. This is real time right now from the northern hemisphere. And if I put the cardinal directions in here. Yep, I had it right. Look at that. South, southwest. <laughs> so between south and west, just go outside and you will be able to see Jupiter, Saturn, Venus is super bright um, all in a row right there. So good. All right, Brian, uh, is there? Yeah. Now, I don't know if you guys caught that, what he said. This is one of two. He's actually working two telescopes tonight. So are you ready to share? Um, are you ready to share the next object? The Actually, I'm, I'm working on my other telescope is, is slightly misbehaving. So I'm working <laughs> on repointing that. But if uh, we could bring up Jupiter again, okay. uh, I've readjusted the exposure so that we can see the Galilean moons. So these would be the four dots that Galileo saw when he pointed a telescope. Actually up at Jupiter. And he was amazed that as he looked from night to night that these were actually in different spots. And so I can tell you what they are here. I have my little cheater chart here. So out here, this one that's farthest away, that appears farthest away, that's Callisto. And then we have Io up here closer. And then right next to each other in their apparent location is Europa and Ganymede. And so there's a sky and telescope has a really nice little page. You could just Google really Jupiter moons and they'll give you a table that'll show you exactly where each moon is. Yes. Yes. So it's very handy. Okay. Great. All right. So now, while you're, um, would it be useful actually, if you guys could drop this in the chat while Brian is aligning his telescope, would it be useful for me to show you real quick where triangulum is? Would you like that? Or Brian can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm actually... You're uh, stealing well, my show well, here. That's how I control a telescope, too. <laughs> so okay, this so is actually, that's where, that's where Jupiter is. That's I haven't switched screens yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm going to uh, okay. actually switch so to the that would telescope. Be useful. All right, so... Okay, great. So, well, let me just, let me show you really quick. If you're not familiar with Triangulum, where it is, we'll flip over to my screen here. And you can see... Um, Let's see here. We are looking between kind of east. And if we take this off, one of the things you'll be able to spot, which we're going to spend a little time on, is Cassiopeia here. And it looks like the W or the M, however it's oriented. Okay. And then one of the ways that I find the triangulum is I will have the Cassiopeia outlined here. And then I will find the Andromeda galaxy. And I do that by taking the larger of the two triangles here. If I connect it, you'll be able to see. Do you see how one triangle is larger than the other one? Okay, so I'll take the larger of the two triangles and I will point it towards these three stars. And these stars are a little fainter, but this star is really, really obvious. And so here, if we zoom in a little bit, you see how I can get the W here, and then I will take these, and then I will point it here, one, two, three, and right at the end, you can see it, because that's the way this program is working right now, it's showing you Andromeda. Andromeda Galaxy is right there, we're gonna take a look at that later. Keep going, and if you just doot, 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 and follow it along, and go about the same distance from the big star to Andromeda, and go the other direction, this is the Triangulum Galaxy. Okay, so that's, a, that's an easy way to find, actually, these two objects that we're going to be looking at tonight. So you have two galaxies right around this, this star in the constellation Andromeda. And I see Brian has something that he's working on. One of the questions was, are you using SharpCap tonight? Yes, I am. I am using SharpCap version 4 for this software, or for, for, as a software that's capturing this, definitely. Okay, great. So why don't you talk us okay. through what you're doing? Okay, so... Um, 
my uh, my higher power telescope that I was going to use to capture Triangulum, I actually bumped the mount and it knocked off its alignment. So I'm still trying to get that to recalibrate. So this is the 178 MC camera is a lower resolution. And uh, so that's why it's a little bit fuzzy right now. I'll work on sharpening that up. But what I've done is I've pointed the telescope, um, my other telescope at the Triangulum Galaxy. And so once I have it, actually in the general area, I use a feature called plate solving. And plate solving compares the picture that's on the screen to a database that has most stars that are visible in the sky. Definitely what we could see with our own eyes. And so you can see now that it's succeeded, this little green bar says it's confirmed. Yes, I am looking at the Triangulum Galaxy. And then it will actually center it in our screen. Now, with uh, this mount, this is called an altitude azimuth mount. And when I try to stack pictures or combine them, I'll only be able to do a few before the rotation of the sky will start to uh, give a, an amazing spirograph effect. <laughs> but definitely want to be able to stack some more images. By stacking, what we do is we keep the noise down in our image, but add the signal. So we get a much higher quality picture. So I'm going to bump up to taking 15 second exposures and then the, I'll have this start to stack. And we see this in the left here. That's a counter of how many images I've combined together. First of all, that's a good sign that it's stacking images because that means it's able to recognize the stars and start uh, astronomy pictures are quite convenient because they have all these little registration dots for the stars that the computer program can actually combine. So it's, actually registering these as if laying one transparency on top of another. So now that I have these, I'm going to stretch this image. And so there we go. That's starting to give the Triangulum Galaxy. And I'm going to see if I can correct the colors a little bit. Wow, that's us. amazing that's, how quickly you got that. Yeah. And so we'll uh, we'll let this stack for a minute and see what we can do. Let me reset the colors. Okay. Right While he's working, um, if you're not familiar with the Triangulum Galaxy, it's uh, the it's a face-on spiral galaxy. You can start to see it looks like what happens when you pull the plug on the mm -hmm. on the uh, drain. <laughs> it starts to <laughs> spiral around. It's the third largest member of our local group of galaxies, and we're in there too, the Milky Way. Um, also, the Andromeda Galaxy is a part of that. Um, the Triangulum is M33. M stands for Messier. It's a catalog of objects that Charles Messier put together. And this one has a magnitude of 5.7. So you will be able to see this on, you, if I'm not mistaken, you can actually, I think I've seen this one in binoculars. Um, uh, yes, you should be able to see. Yeah, you should be able to see this one with binoculars tonight, as long as you've got dark skies and you're not in New York City. And so he actually discovered this back in 1764. Um, sometimes it's been called the Pinwheel Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, even though it's got a fairly bright magnitude of 5.7, it's actually pretty faint uh, because it's larger than the full moon, the size of the diameter of the disk of the moon in the sky. Um, but yeah, from dark skies, you should be able to see it in binoculars. All right. So this is uh, this will be the image that we'll stick with with for the triangulum. And uh, this is a combination now of 102 seconds worth of exposures. And uh, what I did is I adjusted the brightness levels to try to give us a better contrast without blowing out the sky. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I'm nice. going to go... And uh, I'll go ahead and bounce over to the next object. Okay, great. This is one of my favorite objects. And <laughs> is it already ready, or do you want me to point out where this one is? Go ahead and point out where it is, because okay. I'm I'm actually down to do one that telescope. Really quick. Okay. So, so for I know I, there's a few people that just um, pinged me and said, "Hey, I'm outside." Every time you show your face, it's too bright. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. they took us outside <laughs> to do this. So I'll try <laughs> to keep the screen dark for you. Okay, so here we are. We are, yeah, good idea, huh? <laughs> okay, so here's your night sky, and we're looking for the Pleiades. And actually, I was just in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I went to Lowell Observatory. And what was really funny is the, um, the from the University of Phoenix, uh, or I don't know if it's the University of Phoenix, it's one of the universities that has all these astronomers nearby. And one of them was leading a tour of the night sky, and he goes, he, he points to Jupiter and he goes, anybody know what this is? And I didn't even think about it. I just shouted out, Jupiter! And he looks at me and he goes, 
oh, really good. Then he points to Saturn. He goes, what's this? I'm, and I yell out, Saturn. And then he says, he looks at me and he goes, okay. And he points to something else and he goes, what's that? And then I, I, I shouted out the answers. I just couldn't help it. I was so excited. And he looks at me and he goes, fine. You're going to really, really make me do this. And then he points to the Pleiades. And because of, I just wasn't, I wasn't thinking. I looked at it and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. And it was super embarrassing because this is one of the easiest ones to find. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, ha ha, got you. So, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of which, here, I'm not even paying attention to what I'm doing. Um, here, let me get the brackets on it so you can see it. And then I'll point out where you can find it. Okay. And so I have, oh, I have the equator on. I'll turn that off. Um, okay, so let me get rid of the, let me get rid of this here. So um, the way you can find it is if you look outside tonight and you look at the, um, if you look at the, the horizon, you're going to see, depending on where you live in the world, for me in the Northern Hemisphere in California, I see Orion starting to rise. And then you're going to take the three belt stars in Orion and go up until you'll see a V of stars. This is the eye of Taurus the bull. And then you just keep going. And this is the Pleiades. Pleiades is not a great object for a telescope simply because it is so huge. Um, it's a great binocular object. Most people, when they first see this, they think, hey, that's the Little Dipper. And it's not even remotely in the right part of the sky. So, <laughs> so anyway. Um, so this is a this is a fun one to try to find and little kids uh, usually when they're outside if you've got little kids or grandkids or little kids running around your house or something um, you can ask them how many stars they see and then usually it's more than we grown-ups can see <laughs> in the night sky so you can see it here so here's orion here's the eye of the bull and here is uh here is the pleiades and it looks like um so uh, somebody had asked the question um, what kind of cluster it's an open cluster um, it can so uh, it has a visual magnitude of about 1.5 we don't even talk about that too much just because it's so bright and you can just see it and it's about 400 ish light years from us and it's a beautiful beautiful object that you can see a lot of people ask about the blue that you see here and we at one point thought that it was the the gas and dust that the stars that form the stars but now we know that it has been measured that the stars are moving through this cloud of gas and dust um, and so that's kind of a more recent um, a more recent discovery so yeah it, and this looks great naked eye somebody was asking can I see it naked eye yes you can go outside right now you can take me with you if I'm on like a cell phone or something and go outside and look up and you will be able to see it so look towards the east for Orion and keep looking up, 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 and you will see the Pleiades. And Brian, it looks like you have something. So I, I have part of the Pleiades. <laughs> and so I had set up this telescope uh, for a, a, a more magnified view. Mm -hmm. And so this would be an example of looking at Pleiades with a more powerful telescope. <laughs> so we have a couple of its, of its partners here along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And what I may actually do um, next time we go to share an object is I'm actually going to probably go and adjust this telescope to a slightly different power okay. um, so that we can share some more objects. Cause yeah, one of my telescopes is just simply not uh, it's, it'll point to an area of the sky, but my plate solve can't even figure out where it's looking. It's so far off. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So well, um, I'm going to actually try the, we'll go over to the blue snowball, I think. Okay. And we could do that one. And then um, if we want to share the Pleiades, then I can, perhaps I can go out and reconfigure. Okay. That sounds good. Um, right, so let, me, let me go some ahead power. and uh, pull up a few other things we're looking at tonight. Okay. So the, do you want to move over to, um, uh, so Cold War, Cold War 22 is where we are, Cold War. Yeah, Blue Snowball. Okay, so. All right. So this one. one, this is the one that's in uh, Andromeda. Is that right? Right. Okay. So, oh, and it looks like I'm sharing the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so you're here watching me try to restart Stellarium because it crashed. <laughs> okay, so let's Don't go you love back live, to... live shows? What's that? Don't you love live shows? I do. Yeah, this is this is real. There's no editing here at all. It's like, oops, <laughs> that was my ceiling. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so let's take a look. If we want to look for Andromeda Galaxy, the easiest way to do that is to go, um, is for me to share the right screen again. Here we go. The easiest way to do that is to, I'll put the compass back on, is to look for, you tell me when you see uh, Cassiopeia. Do you see it yet? Okay, you tell me when you see it. Here, I'll zoom around the sky a little bit. If I zoom in a little bit, maybe you see it. A little bit more. Yeah, you kind of see Cassiopeia right there. Okay, good. All right, so this is going to be an easy one for you to find tonight. Remember, here, if I put my compass back up, um, it's going to be between north and east, and you're just going to look up. So you can kind of see Orion is coming up over my horizon here right now. And uh, Cassiopeia is actually pretty high right now. So if you have binoculars, you might get a neck ache if you stare at it <laughs> too much. Um, and so this large triangle points to do, 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 those three here. And this is actually part of the Andromeda, um, uh, the Andromeda, which is right in here, uh, the constellation of Andromeda. And Within so, the, the boundaries of the constellation. Yes, the boundaries. Right? Oh, yeah, I should put the boundaries on too. It's kind of a funky one. Um, so this one is also known as NGC 7662. And, okay. And so if you'll notice, it kind of flipped it around. Let me flip it back, this program. Um, okay, so here's Cassiopeia. And here's what we had just found. Remember the three stars? And then we went further and Triangulum was right in here. Okay, and Andromeda is here. What we're gonna do is we are going to go more overhead to right in this region. And this is one you really want to telescope for. Let's see if I can blow it up a little bit. And I, oh, it doesn't have a picture of it. Okay, there you go. All right. Hey, and you want to see what Brian has? Take a look at this. Oops. I'll wait till he's oh, got a Oh, sorry. Shot. <laughs> <laughs> I just started a, a stack. <laughs> okay. So um, some, uh, this one's known as the Snowball Nebula or the Blue Snowball. Um, it's a planetary nebula, has nothing to do with planets. They just misnamed it and the name stuck. You ever have a nickname like that in, like when you were in elementary school? <laughs> so <laughs> this one is best seen really now uh, in the fall. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you'll want to look for it low in the Northern skies more in the springtime. This one's fainter. It's got a magnitude of about 8.3. Uh, you can see it with binoculars, but you really need dark skies for this one. Um, just for size comparison, the full moon is 30 arc minutes across. That's how big it is across. This one is only two arc minutes across. So this is a small object you're going to be looking at. Um, uh, from star party days, I remember people using telescopes of all sizes. And if Kent was here, he would actually be telling you something like, uh, if if you look at it in low magnification, it'll just look like a star. Um, and so you need higher magnification to see a nebula. Um, Medium-sized telescopes, like 8-inch, 10-inch, um, they'll show it. But that central star, you won't be able to see unless you've got, like, a really big telescope. So how are we doing? Yeah. Should, we, should we flip over to you now? You yeah, let's come back over. And All right. What, what's yeah, most feel free distinctive... to interrupt me anytime. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what's most distinctive, <laughs> I find, is is the, the color difference. When you, well, that's too small. <laughs> when you um, compare to the stars in the region, mm -hmm. then, you know, at, at a lower power, it just looks like another star. But you'll notice I find it to be a more pale blue. Mm -hmm. And so, so far we can see it's, it's starting to give me a little bit more structure. I'm going to try to magnify it just a little bit. But we okay. notice how my stars aren't circles anymore. And that that's part <laughs> that's of not a good thing of, of the tracking of this scope, but we can still get some structure out of here. I see it though. There it is. So yeah, there it is here. And so I'm gonna try to back down the uh, the levels and see if we can get. Yeah, I think that if we do this, then I'm st you're starting to see a little bit more of. If I drop it down, you can see more of that internal structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what we would do to have an actual picture to share with others after the fact is is we would uh, have a lot more control over the exposure and then we would use many different steps of processing software to bring out the the details of this but i'm satisfied with with uh, this little refractor on the kind of mount i'm actually pretty tickled by by the yeah, fact that we're able to actually show the diameter uh, what size is it this is a 120 millimeter 120 millimeter okay yeah yeah that's a nice view 
And so, so then this is uh, two minutes, 30 seconds worth of exposure time. And I'm actually going to pause the stack there before it starts to get some screen rotation. Okay. <clears throat> so this is an example then too. Um, what, what I'm finding is using SharpCap software is actually really useful for sharing the night sky out in the public where we'll have some telescopes where you can look through the eyepiece and then others where we can show on a computer screen because we would not be able to see any of this structure with our eyeballs. <laughs> so this right. is a handy way to be able to look in more detail. Yeah, and that's yet another reason to take a photograph because you lose so yes. much just by staring at it. I agree. All and, right. Oh, speaking of staring at it, if you are yes. looking at this one, um, you definitely want to try looking straight on versus looking off to the side. Like if you look um, off mm -hmm. to the side of the computer screen right now, so like if you look at the frame of either your phone or the computer, um, but you notice even though you're looking at the frame right now, you can still see the blue dot in the middle. So by using averted vision, by not looking straight on, because you've got these blind spots in the middle of your eye, um, you can also see more um, more color or you can see more resolution depending on what you're going for. So definitely try different uh, focal point, or try focusing on different points mm -hmm. while you're looking. And the longer you look, the usually the more you get to see. And so this is the full frame on the camera that I'm using now. So you can oh, wow. see how you start to see. And if I were to stretch this or increase the brightness, then you'd start, and that's a little too much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so one thing with this program, there's two places to stretch. And if one stretched, then it's a double stretch and then you get that. So anyways, here, here now that I've had to adjust the brightness, you can see it brought out a lot more stars. Yeah. But I, I still find that the, you'll know that you're on that, that nebula because of the, the distinct difference in the color, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So looking at where we are in the sky, I think I can actually do Andromeda now. Oh, okay. With let's this let's flip over to Andromeda then. Yeah. Okay. So we just have a couple more objects. Actually, we are zooming through this super fast. Yeah. I hope you're enjoying it. If you are, can you drop us a note so we know how um, what you like and uh, what, how you're enjoying this program? That would help us give us feedback, especially since. It's kind of like a one-way presentation, <laughs> so <laughs> getting your, your thoughts and ideas and feedback are, are fantastic. Um, Andromeda. Andromeda, I already showed you where it is, so we're just going to stick here with Brian while he pulls that up. Um, to answer one of the earlier questions, some galaxies are spiral-shaped, like the ones we live in, and they have curved arms like a pinwheel. And others are elliptical. They can be smooth, oval-shaped, and the rest are like blobs. They come in all kinds of weird shapes. <laughs> and so those are the three broad categories of, um, of galaxies. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, it's a spiral galaxy. It's uh, the largest one in our local group. It's more than twice the size of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, uh, somebody had asked, uh, how long would it take if you were in a rocket ship? Uh, not in this class, but the last class I did. Um, and it would be about 40 billion years to travel there by a rocket ship. I actually had to figure that out. Um, this galaxy is actually pretty close to us, astronomically speaking. You can see it. Uh, uh, you can see it. Um, it's a naked eye. It's the only one that's naked eye from the northern hemisphere. Those of you who live in the southern hemisphere, you live south of the equator, you are lucky ducks because you have two galaxies you can see. We can only see one in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so the one in the Southern, uh, there's large and small Magellanic clouds are the two that you can see. Um, so you don't even need binoculars. If you do, it's even better. It's got a magnitude of about 3.4 and you're basically looking for a green smudge. So it will not look like a star. It'll just look like a fuzzy greenish sort of a thing. Um, and when Brian gets this one up, I want you to see if you can find not only Andromeda, but the other galaxies called satellite galaxies. Um, you can have galaxies orbiting other galaxies. You can have smaller satellite galaxies, all on their own, which are their own little collection of stars and solar systems that go around their own centers, and they also at the same time go around a much larger galaxy. So, yeah, I mean, a hundred years ago, a couple hundred years ago, we we just had no idea. Oh, that's it! You've got it. Yes, and so you could see really with Andromeda, if you're familiar with uh, looking at this through a telescope, how much power I threw on this with the Barlow because I had intended to do the planets with this telescope. <laughs> but, uh, but now Andromeda is just so huge that we're, uh, we're getting really the core and we can see some of the dust lanes. 
but uh this mm-hmm. is at the this is the widest field I can show right now with this setup. So our our companion galaxies, alas, are are out of the field. Nice. But uh, we'll you'll notice that as I stack a few more images here, then the uh, fuzzy areas will start to uh, resolve with some more clarity, and we get a little bit better. So we'll just uh, take a look at this one and see see if we get the image to improve just a little bit as it goes. Okay. Now, while he's um, cleaning things up there, this is the picture that most people think of when um, they've seen pictures of Andromeda. And these are pictures that you can actually take with a backyard telescope and a nice dark night and no airplanes going through it, <laughs> no stars going through it. Um, so, yeah, do you see the satellite galaxies here? And so let's see if we can find one in Brian's image. I, we'll see how yours is oriented. And yes, a few people mentioned that this is on a collision course with our Milky Way galaxy. It's not going to happen in your lifetime, so don't worry. Um, I once, Dave Major said he traced this one out uh, on his dark sky, sky, dark sky site. It was more than, wow, five degrees. I was actually wondering. And Tom Fry, hi, Tom. <laughs> and hi, Dave. Andromeda is about 10 billion years old and has about one trillion stars. Um, let's see. And we have a question, a telescope question for you. Uh, well, Brian is running two uh, telescopes right now. Um, they're asking, what is the focal length of your telescope? Yes, I'm going to bring up the notes on that. Yeah, is that what you were doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Running three screens, so it's you know which yes. which one does the file open up on? <laughs> yeah, it, that's a beautiful picture. Nice. Thanks. Um, so you can notice how, um, because this is not a um, an equatorial mount, this is an altitude azimuth mount, you can notice how we started to lose the corners here mm-hmm. because of the frame rotation. So, but sharp cap, sharp cap amazingly was still able to find the dots to register the stars and stacked what it could see. So it helped us to get a pretty good picture. Nice. Yeah, and if you own a telescope, let us know what kind you have. Or if you have binoculars, let us know. Or if you don't, let us know which one you want to get. (laughs) (laughs) You can drop us a note let us know what what type of equipment you're on or what equipment you're hoping to get sometime. I can tell you the one that's behind my head when you see my face again, that's an 8-inch Schmidt-Cassegrain. It's a Mead LX200. And uh, it's such a workhorse of a scope. So um, my this Orion uh, AstroView has a focal length of 600 millimeters, mm-hmm. so it comes in at a focal ratio of f5, and then I am running a 2x Barlow on this. Um, okay. So, in, oh, so and that what's I could, a Barlow? Do you want to tell people about? Yes, that? that's a good good question. <laughs> a Barlow is a special lens that you put between your eyepiece and then the eyepiece holder in your telescope, and it'll have a little multiplier on the end. So it's using an extra lens or lenses to magnify the image even more. So it doubles the magnification for us. And the drawback is everything will be more dim. But when I have a camera, then I just adjust my exposures to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. So Nice. All right, we have one last object. Do you think you can get the last... Yeah, I am going to definitely give it the old college try. Okay. I'll reset my clear. <laughs> I'm. Uh, we see what it did with uh, with Andromeda here. Uh, also mm-hmm. wondering about another planet that's up that I could definitely share if we oh, have time. Oh, okay. Maybe Great. we could do that as a bonus object. <clears throat> so let's bring up the. Are we taking owl. requests now? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> In my own brain, yes, I request. Oh, from it. yourself, okay. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, what could I show with this field of view? <laughs> Nice. I'm gonna go have a talk with my other telescope once I get once I finish. <laughs> so we should probably clear out the Andromeda images and then Sure. While Brian's do that, I can continue my story in Lowell. So I they have a thirty inch um uh like a thirty inch obsession, so it's like a thirty inch Dobsonian. The mount is on the ground, there's no tripod. 
and um, it wasn't uh, the tracking wasn't working too well, and so he had it on I think M15, and which just filled the whole eyepiece. It was so beautiful, and uh, of course, you know, it quickly went out of the eyepiece. So I was up on the ladder, and he says, "Here, let me adjust it for you." And I said, "No, no, it's fine. I can I can totally adjust it." And so I did, and he comes back up the ladder, and he's like. He's like, you're the, you're the first person that's been able to adjust our telescopes. I'm like, oh. And he looks at me and he goes, are you a real astronomer? I'm like, well, um, I don't get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. Um, one of the cool things they did is they, um, because they have so much public up there, they... Uh, they took some aquarium pebbles, uh, uh, those little rocks at the bottom of like a fish tank, and they spray painted them with glow-in-the-dark paint, and then they pressed them into the concrete. And so during the day, the, con- the, the concrete charges up, but it looks like stardust is just splattered all over because it's the, just like they threw it down and then kind of pressed it in when the concrete was curing, setting. I don't know what the right word is there. Um, but it was super cool because you're walking on like these this blue stardust lane to go up to the observatory, which I thought was all right. We definitely have a good shot of the owl cluster. Perfect. Okay, great. I'm done talking. You go ahead. <laughs> all right. So here we have <gasps> oh, look the, at the that. owl. You can totally see him. And and so th- this is one of those where you don't have to wonder. It's like why do they call it that? <laughs> <laughs> So what are we looking at, Brian? So so what this is, is an open cluster of stars. And when we say open cluster, that would be a collection of stars that are still gravitationally bound to each other, but it's a much more loose collection than the opposite, which you might think would be closed cluster, but no, it's globular (laughs) for the other one. And so this one uh, was, it has a couple of designations as usual. With the NGC catalog or new general catalog, that one is called NGC 457. Uh, but then Caldwell came along and he made another list of objects similar to the Messier list. And this would come in as Caldwell 13. Um, this cluster goes by a few different names it, and, and maybe some of them have copyright infringements because <laughs> they'll also call it the ET cluster. <laughs> And uh, this, this one's one was really nicknamed by the um, the editor of Astronomy Magazine or something like that. I seem mm. to remember some trivia about this one. Oh uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and you know, what's fun with Stellarium is they will add so many different of oh. the nicknames for these. Some of them like are quite obscure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I see the dragonfly cluster, the owl cluster. Here, let me, um, I'll flip over just for a quick second okay, to where good. to find this one. Uh, do you see Cassiopeia here? One, two, three, four, where to talk, or one, two, three, four, five. We talked about how to find this one. Do you see how close it is to Cassiopeia? So just look t- uh, towards the smaller triangle and just kind of browse around here and you'll find it. And this picture doesn't do it justice compared to what you have there. So we're just going to keep looking at yours. So here, let's go back to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, somebody had asked earlier uh, what type of cluster. Um, open clusters, there's like, I think there's five different kinds of clusters. I could be wrong, but I think it's five. But mostly it's open clusters and globular mm. clusters. So um, so they're usually, the, the open clusters are usually found within the galactic plane. And they're almost mm. always found um, with, the galaxies that have um, like found in the spiral arms of galaxies um, they have a few hundred stars they're not super populated it's kind of like we're living in the country instead of the city like a globular <laughs> cluster um, somebody was asking about the fuzzy blue stuff the nebulosity um, that you're seeing here mm-hmm. right so with that it's actually i don't think this open cluster technically has nebulosity associated with it this would be an example of an achromatic refractor. So when you get refractor telescopes and picture refractor, that's the classic tube with a series of lenses. But the fun thing with wavelengths of light is different color wavelengths come to different focal points when you just put them through a basic lens. And so mine is an achromatic refractor, which means blue doesn't quite come into focus that requires some extra lenses. That's why you'll see refractors called doublets or triplets. Mm, And so with with mine, 
this is an achromatic. It I still does amazing images, but mm-hmm. what I usually do is I actually add a filter specifically designed to help back out some of the blue. Um, but that's on the other filter wheel. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, so that's why we see this extra glow. I, I think it does kind of add a, a little bit of in, interesting, um, I guess, um, aesthetics to yeah. the image to have that glow. Yeah. But uh, I'm a big fan of trying to provide as scientifically accurate images. <laughs> and sometimes they'll go for artistic license, right? But, <laughs> but so, yeah. So if you looked at these through binoculars, then you you would probably not see that glow. Oh, yes. And you can look at them, this one, through <laughs> Yes, this would be a good binocular should. object. Yes, I agree. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, somebody's asking, for, or you got a request here from Tom Fry. He's wondering about Gamma Andromeda, a beautiful Yeah, and so I was just going to, to take a look at my software um, to confirm. I see Gamma 2, but why don't we hop over to Saturn, and then I'm going to double check how, how I could bring up um, oh, Gamma okay. Andromeda. Oh, okay, that's great. Here, we'll just stick with Brian here. Um, okay. The only picture I have now is of the nebula, or I'm sorry, the, the comet um, right oh, now. Yeah. So while he's doing that, I can talk to you a little bit about uh, A1 Leonard. So the it's an inbound long period comet. So this one was discovered back in January 3rd of this year. So 2021, this is a year before its closest approach. <clears throat> And um, let's see, it looks like here, I'm reading from the article that, of the data, and it says uh, it's the first, it was at, when it was at the frost line uh, where methanol and water started to sublimate. Um, this is the first comet discovered in 2021. Um, it has a retrograde orbit. And on 12th, uh, December 12th, so next week, this comet will be, 0.233 AUs, so about 35 million kilometers from the Earth. And just a few days later, on the 18th, it's going to be 4.2 million kilometers from Venus. And so it's going to make its closest approach to the Sun on January 3rd of next year. They're, ex- they're saying it may be naked eye, but with comets, you never know. <laughs> so it may be naked eye, or it may not be. Um, but if it is, it will happen in December. So you might get an early Christmas present. And so this will be a good um, good object to look at with binoculars. And it says here they had recorded on October 10th. It showed a short but dense dust tail. Um, and in late November, it had a total magnitude of about eight. Let's see, should I keep talking? Um, <laughs> so we can... Uh... We can, I should be able to, it's just slewing now over to, to okay. Saturn. So let me flip cameras. I was looking up gamma. Oh. Saturn's getting a little low. So let me see if we can still get it. All right. So Brian is not looking at the comet right now because no. you yeah, can't because look it's the still Earth. The Earth, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. But I do have an image taken. I didn't get the date of the image, but it was taken by Larry uh, from our club. And I'm going to share that with you as well. Yeah, this would be a good time to think to share that. Oh, yeah, uh, share unfortunately, okay, so Saturn's too you... low. Yeah, okay. Saturn's too low. Hi, this is Aurora. Welcome to a live <laughs> show. <laughs> All right, here is the picture uh, taken from Larry. And if I, uh, I don't know if I can get the, the date on that. I'll have to go digging for it. Um, so this one has so comet A1 has been inside of the orbit of Neptune since May 2009. So um, let's see. It's what else can I tell you about it? It's basically the estimation is it's got an 80,000 year orbital period. So that means it's spent about the last 40,000 years being inbound, which places it about 3,700 AUs uh, from <laughs> from that's from from where we are. Um, after its closest approach, it's going to be ejected from the solar system. And let's see, and it will remain hyperbolic after September 2022. Okay, that's all right. So yeah, so if you want to see it, now is the time because chances are you and I are not going to get another chance to see this one. So it looks like it was made yesterday. So M3, yes, yes, I believe that is M3. Thank you, yeah. Dave. 
I should have mentioned that. M M3, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, I should say this comet is fun because not only are we anticipating naked eye status, but it's flown by more than a few nice deep sky objects for photo ops. Mm -hmm. So so that's been, a, astronomers are having lots of fun capturing it as it goes by other objects. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a beautiful picture there. So interestingly, in my uh, Starry Night software, um, it looks like uh, Gamma Andromedae is actually also called ALMAC. And so it, I had to search on ALMAC in order to find it. Oh, okay. So do you want me to come back to you? Yeah, go ahead and come back to me. So okay. what I'm going to do now is I need to see if I can split this double. And so I'm going to drop the game right, down. So Brian's making some adjustments. I have no idea what he's doing. I'm just grateful he knows how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, there we see there. So, so this is, let me just give you an example. <clears throat> when, when, just like with a regular camera, if you collect too much light, then you overexpose and everything's washed out. And so when you're looking for double stars, then sometimes the companions are very close to each other and will be lost in that wash from the overexposure. So I have two main controls, the gain, which you could think roughly like ISO on a, on a film camera, but it doesn't have direct correlations. It's unique to each camera. But then I have the exposure time. And so by backing down my exposure time here, then here at 3.83 seconds, you can now, whoops, it, okay, sorry, I recalibrated that. Let me change that. I got excited and double clicked. So I'm going to, it's interesting, it keeps on tweaking itself. Somewhere I've got like an auto exposure on, I think, because it, uh, oh, I know what it is. The way the cameras are designed, um, anything lower than two seconds is a different mode. And so I had it in a, a mode that ex expects two seconds or more. But anyways, enough about exposures. Here it is. What do you think, <laughs> Tom? There you go. So amazing to see the two different yeah. distinct colors with okay. this. I agree. That is a nice double. So uh, I think it would be useful to share where this is. Oh, okay. Um, I, can I bet that. Stellarium will, will know it as Amac also. And it's nice. It'd be one of the main stars, I think, right in or close to in the constellation Andromeda. Yes. My Andro my Stellarium is misbehaving. So give me just a second to work okay. on it here. Why I might, you guys I'll, keep looking at the pictures? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is, that's a, we just gaze at this, by the way, notice I've, I've, um, multiplied the my native image if i drop this down this is full wide scale or wide full wide view of this and we can actually still split that binary and that's what we use the term when you're testing to see how well your telescope and setup is doing is if you point it at a binary some are closer than others and if you could still make out the two separate ones that's called splitting the binary um <clears throat> okay here we go so where do you see this one this one is at the tail end, and correct me if I've got the wrong one, but I think I've got the right star. I don't have my charts in front of me. Mm. Um, so we have Cassiopeia. It's pointing to Andromeda, which is here. You can see Andromeda Galaxy. Here's Triangulum. We talked about that. And this time, here's the great square of Pegasus, and we are simply going down, down, down right there. Is that right? So I'm I'm actually looking at uh, still looking at my telescope view. I oh, you're looking at the telescope. <laughs> oh, did I forget um, to switch the view? Am I just talking? And no, that's a, no, because I I have uh, so many screens going on. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, did okay. you um, and if you search on yeah, you've got Almac, so that's it. I do. Okay. Yep, that's it. And what's fun is with Stellarium, as you know, Aurora, but to share yeah. with the audience, if you zoom in, uh, oh, then yes. Stellarium will tell you. It'll show you that f the fact. Yeah, but it's not yeah. nearly as pretty as yours. I mean, no, I those. agree because this is our own eyeballs. Get, well, yeah, closer so. to our. I guess it's least. Which it's one still... would you prefer, that one <laughs> or this one? Yeah, <laughs> I like this. Is a nice crisp image, and that's where refractors are fun, right? Is is they can often get that really crisp image, except that uh, the fact that of course that blues will get a little fuzzy. Now you'll notice here how the uh, larger star. 
looks like flares are coming off of this. These are not solar flares. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, you could also notice how it's starting to pixelate. It looks like it's from an Atari 2600 or something. <laughs> hey, and, I have one of those. <laughs> I still have one in my garage. You still have one? <laughs> oh, no. And, <laughs> and so this like is, it. we're literally working now at 600% at individual pixels. Now, amazingly, astronomers, when they study, sometimes for these more distant objects, that's all they get is a pixel or two to gather information. And they can actually gather spectral or, or, or color information that could tell them about the elements and such that are involved in these stars. Mm -hmm. for, for mine, this is my backup camera, and it has, oh, half the resolution as my main camera. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's on a telescope that's not behaving. But still, I think this is... I think this is a very good grand finale object for our yeah, evening. Yeah, that's awesome. So thank you, Tom. We're getting for... some questions about separation. Tom Fry says he's got it at 10 arc seconds. And then mm -hmm. you've got people asking, what's an arc second? Yeah, that's a good question. Tom brought it up. I think we should make him explain it. Yeah, just kidding. Tom, did you want to discuss <laughs> arc seconds? <in> <laughs> that's okay. We're just kidding. <laughs> so uh, to and uh, Kent gives a, a wonderful explanation yes. of this as well, of course. So the idea is, if you picture how the sky looks to us, it is as if we are at the center of a sphere and we are from the inside looking out. And so when we actually measure how objects appear in relation to their size in the sky or in their separation, then we start with degrees and then you divide degrees into minutes and then you divide minutes into seconds and then you go down to arc seconds. So it's a smaller and smaller measurement. Mm -hmm. Somewhat think like um, meter, centimeter, millimeter. You're going to smaller, smaller measurements. So when we talk arc seconds, that's a very, very tiny little piece of the sky. To give you a little bit of a cons comparison, the full moon appears to be about the size of half a degree, which by the way, if you have a piece of, uh, of notebook paper that holes punched in it if you hold that at arm's length that's about half a degree also the sun will not the don't talk about the sun it's about the same apparent size which is why eclipse work but we never want to look at the sun without proper filters so apologize for that going back to the moon if you hold a piece of paper at arm's length with a hole punched in it then it'll just about fill that so that gives you an idea so i hope that's a good brief explanation of where perfect the, yeah that was great and i was wondering if you were going to get this question and you have why is it green and is it really green is that a true color image yes this is a well now i can't call it a true color image because i would need to calibrate it yes. um which i use it and i can actually do that but i have to take it into a different program now yeah. th what's going on is stars actually we're able to tell their temperature by their color. And so this then, and I'd have to check with the green. Now what this I one actually, thing- actually, it's supposed to be blue green, but yeah. so it makes sense why and, it's only showing green. And so, um, and of course we're also looking at pretty low resolution. Now I could, I can still stack this, although it's going to be a little bit extra chore. And then once I have it in a stacked image, then I get my extra histogram controls where I have more control over the brightness and the colors. And I can actually tell it to calibrate based on the colors in the image from the star colors. So if I, if I adjust this, yeah, it's still not actually getting much of a collection, but yes, they are these two different colors. And that's another fun thing with binaries, actually. Another great binary to look at is Albireo. And then you'll get two very distinct color stars. And in fact, if you look at skymaps.com, which we we would probably want to bring up oh, or yes. bring it up right now. Yes. Skymaps.com gives an amazing monthly chart for free. One side shows you the night sky for that month at around 10 o'clock in the evening. And then the other side of the paper, when you print it two-sided, will give you a list of naked eye, telescope and binocular objects. And they always list some very choice uh, binaries in there. So you do not even need binoculars to start your enjoyment of the night sky. Yeah. Go out there and there's a whole list of objects that you can look at naked eye. But then once you get your pair of binoculars, which we always recommend you start with binoculars when you get into astronomy, 
binoculars are an awesome way to learn more about the constellations in the night sky. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when you're ready with telescope, or if you have one already, then they even give you telescope objects. So Perfect. I hope that helps share a little bit more about yes. binaries. Yes. And I was just sharing, I don't know if you saw, but I was just sharing where you find it. I did. On the I did so, see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can just find sky maps and they're free. All right. So I'm wondering if there's any other questions. Uh, any other questions? That would require me actually looking. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, I just flipped over to the chat um, also. Yes. Uh, so I think maybe while you're looking, I could give a quick summary. Tonight yeah. we were able to share um, a, a wide range of objects that shows all the different things. We've showed something from our solar system, uh, namely Jupiter. We we're able to then look out ridiculously far away at the Triangulum Galaxy. And we were able to show you both an open cluster and a planetary nebula. And then now we've, we've uh, wrapped up with a binary star. And then just to make sure, I don't know that I officially stated this, this is called binary. These stars are orbiting each other. And so you could thank uh, Star Wars for introducing right, the Tatooine having two stars. We always think of that with the binary star system. <clears throat> So, and uh, yeah, and Aurora, I see you, you posted the sky maps link. I did. I did. And chat. oh, who awesome. are we? You know, I didn't even have our tagline on supercharged. Oh. <laughs> oh, wait, no, we're not supercharged. We are central coast astronomy.org. And if you have not visited our website, you absolutely need to. So central coast yes. astronomy.org. In fact, I don't think you could see this without visiting our website. So um, <laughs> you don't have to be local to be a member. We would love it if you guys joined us. And we love being, bringing these presentations to you as well. Definitely. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please do let us know in the comments. We love to hear from you and let you know what you liked. And so we can do more of that. And yeah, do you? If, I'm trying to see if we have any other questions. Um, I did have a couple of quick little shares if you want me to do that while people are typing in. I love it when people type things in. It makes me feel like I'm just not talking yes, to there. Yes, that we, we have people <laughs> so here, let me interacting. Share All right, so um, a couple of quick things. Binoculars, you can spend anywhere from $30 to $250. Uh, it's really up to you. These are 35 These are Comatrons from Celestron. My favorite is a pair called Ultra Views from Orion. They're probably about $150. Um, there's, I just got a new book, but I haven't actually used it. It's called Turn Left at Orion. Have you used this one? Yes. Um, you have? Yes, I have it too. Oh, it's behind my green screen, so I can't. Okay, so sure, this sure. is another resource. There's a couple others. Um, this is an yeah. old, old I might one. mention with yeah. Turn Left at Orion, what I liked is that when it shares the objects, it gives you a little graph that shows what level equipment you should try with. So in other words, oh, if it yeah. requires only binoculars or large, then it'll say, Hey, here's binoculars. Or if you need a larger scope. So I found that that helps you. Yeah, there we go. See, so this one, this M47, so you can see it's reasonable with uh, binoculars or then even up to the, that's, because yeah, yeah. you know what happens is you might think, hey, how could you ever run out of power or or never have enough power, right? We always want a bigger aperture scope. <laughs> well, I showed an example of that because I tried to look at Andromeda mm -hmm. and we end up seeing only the core because that was too much magnification. Yeah, so alas, it, it, there is such thing as too much magnification. <laughs> there is a, such a thing. Here, let's go back to your face. Where are you? So you're not just this disembodied voice talking. <laughs> Um, yes, another, uh, Terrence Dickinson, I can reach it, also wrote, um, has written a number of books. Uh, Nightwatch is a good one if you're brand That's new to That's a astronomy. very good and one. So this is one that will walk you through and answer a lot of great questions and walk you through the night sky piece by piece. And so Nightwatch is another one. This is um, more of a beginner book. And if you're really into astronomy, um, like if you're interested in like, the, I would recommend going through the Messier catalog. This is an atlas, and I think, what's the one that's all red? The that's the Messier Marathon field Messier guide. Messier Marathon book. Yeah. And so you can take a look at those as well. And so here, there you are. So yay! <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, let's see. We, um, you can always watch the recording. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it, will, it will stay up. 
And mm -hmm. if you have any, uh, <laughs> if you have any other questions, do type it in. We'll stay here for another couple of minutes to help answer your questions from tonight's. Um, somebody was asking about your second telescope. So you have a refractor tonight, and then you had. <clears throat> right. The other one that was not behaving. Uh, is a Celestron 8-inch Cassegrain. Actually, the body is is almost exactly like yours or the optical tube assembly. Oh, but oh then the, I, the one over here? Right. But then I pulled it off the fork and then uh, put what's called a dovetail so it could go on, on other mounts. So I have it attached to a Celestron Advanced VX. And that one is a... Um, equatorial mount which means one axis is pointed right at the way the earth spins towards the north pole and that one can track you know i can take a five minute exposure when i have it set up correctly um, the drawback with that because i don't have a pier or a, a, a central post it's actually the mounts on a tripod then when i look at something up close top to the high towards the top of the sky or the zenith which is straight up then my camera's extended out the back and bumps against the leg. Oh. And once that happens, then you can just imagine the kind of unhappy noises the motors make, and then it's out of alignment. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I discovered that five minutes before showtime. <laughs> so oh, I tried no. to reset it and such and told it to use its last known calibration, but clearly that oh, did no. not do the job. Yeah, so, so that, that other telescope, that was going to be the deep sky object telescope, but... My okay. refractor, I think, did did just fine. Oh, yes. And so does that mean that we get to do this again? I think so. Yes. I think we should do it again. What do you guys think? Again. Should we do this yes. again? This was kind of a new thing for us. Um, usually we have Kent with us, and he, he tells uh, we spend much more time on each object. But we wanted to try something different, and we're going to continue to do the, uh, the presentations with Kent. In fact, the next one... I forget if it's January or February. Yeah, we, we plan to do one quarterly, right? And then yes. share some views as uh, yes. as weather permits. But but I think that this was fun just to have a little start party and just to share some objects and then even take requests. Yes. I kind of like that idea. Yeah, and that's a good point too. So if we were to do this next time, um, we could absolutely take requests. So if you have something you'd like to see and or you're curious if it's up, we can definitely help you with that as well. We like to be super interactive and super fun. Um, <laughs> so <excited. laughs> yes. if you are on our, if you're not on our mailing list, um, go to centralcoastastronomy.org and get on it. And that way you will get our announcements when we are going live. And so you can get those. We usually send them out a few days ahead of time. And then that day we'll also say, hey, tonight's the night. Join us. Here's the link. And so that's also a great way to stay connected with us as well. And um, somebody had asked, can we be a member even if we're not in California? The answer is yes. We have members worldwide mm -hmm. right now because yes, we, we do. are doing all of our presentations online. We've been doing this for, this is almost uh, year two. And so we're very excited that we can go, you can go back and rewatch any of those. So for example, if what month are we in? December? You can go back to December 2020. <laughs> just ignore the stuff about the planets in the very beginning. And then the rest of it is still accurate for what we were doing. And Kent and Brian and I, we had gone through every single month of for, I think it was 16 months, 17 months in a row. Um, yes, right. Yes. Those are all still Focusing available. Focusing on what was, pun intended, what's up in the night sky, how you can look at it naked eye with binoculars. And so you can absolutely go through those as well. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, other questions? We will be discussing other objects. Okay, perfect. Um, great. So if you've got any other questions, let us know. You can send us an email through centralcoastastronomy.org. But otherwise, we will see you next time. So thank you so much, Brian. Yes. Thank you for setting up You're all welcome. your equipment for us. My sharing. pleasure. Yay. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. I will send out an email that has the information about our next date. And so um, stay in touch with me and I will see you soon. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>